Welcome to In The Trenches, where entrepreneurs, artists, writers, designers, inventors, warriors, and leaders share their stories of doing the hard, creative work that impacts all of our lives. Let the journey inspire you to do something worthwhile, build something bold, and create your life's work. And now, your host, Tom Morgus. Welcome back, everyone, to another broadcast of In the Trenches. I'm really excited to have on today's show, Kurt Elster, who has an MBA as a senior e-commerce consultant who helps Shopify store owners uncover hidden profits in their websites. He's a graduate of the University of Chicago, and he went on to build a top-ranked agency, which we're going to talk about today, uh, EtherCycle, which has produced successful websites for Verizon, the NFL, and Hilton Hotels. And uh, today, Kurt and EtherCycle team use their experience to exclusively help Shopify store owners. And so we'll talk a little bit about Shopify and all that, but probably primarily talk about sales and marketing and all that good stuff in today's, uh, today's show. So Kurt, thanks so much for being on the call. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. It's an awesome. honor and a privilege. Heck yeah. And and so I've, I've checked out your stuff. I really enjoy it. I think you have some really great advice on e-commerce and, and sales online. So for those who are listening, um, I guess I'll start out by just saying if you head over to KurtElster.com, which is Kurt, K-U-R-T-E-L-S-T-E-R.com, you can find a lot of good information just on sales in general, like online sales. So that's a good place to start. But Tell us a little bit about how you got into the e-commerce uh, genre, e-commerce just world in in general, um, and then we'll get into what you're doing today. Sure, that's a great question. I went, um, actually started my first full time job out of college, or you know, my first full time job once I was done with my my too many years of education. Um, I was working as a product manager for a local drop shipping company that sold auto parts, and I had fun. I thought it was cool because it was you know, I was a car guy. And I, you know, would blow my whole paycheck on, on discounted car parts at that time because um, it seemed like the thing to do. But I really, you know, I wasn't satisfied, um, and it it was really it was a struggle for me to not own my own business. I think I just think I don't have the personality for it. Um, and I I said okay, I'm going to quit and start a e commerce platform, and that turned out to be um, foolhardy. You know, big dreams, aim big. Um, and we after a year we ended up. Um, just doing like traditional freelance WordPress development. Um, and then we started narrowing down to, okay, we only do stuff for creative agencies. So that's how we got those big brands. But even that, you know, it was very stressful, even though they were big budgets, but the effective hourly rate turned out to be very low. And in the meantime, we were doing these local businesses um, and had narrowed it down to e-commerce as the fun thing to do and that we were good at. And Shopify was the best. And it was, you know, this the platform was coming up at the time. So we just, jumped on the Shopify experts thing. And about two years ago, I just said, you know what, let's only, let's niche down. Let's just only do this one thing and only do Shopify. And it was by far the best decision we ever made. So, yeah. So tell me about that. Like why, why I mean, everybody talks about, you know, niching down. I, I think there's a ton of value in it. Um, and I wonder if I, I, I don't do it enough or, or should do it more and get, you know, more refined. But tell me a little bit about that choice to go just with Shopify? Like how did it, how did you find that that was the angle you wanted to go and, and how did you know to pursue that? So yeah, there's a couple, well, there's a couple questions there. One's really about, you know, how do you know, why should you niche down? When should you niche down? How do you know when, what to niche down on? And why is it so scary? Like I have seen people reduced to tears by the idea of you have to pick one tiny thing to work on and it will be okay. And then the, you know, a lot of people push back on it. Well, so in my case, you know, we didn't just pick a thing to niche down on and just say, all right, anyone who's doing anyone, anything else, go away. What we actually did was create, uh, we launched a productized service called Website Rescues, put it on its own domain name so that we didn't cannibalize our core business, and then we worked on sending leads to that. And initially what we did was set up multiple landing pages on that domain name for different platforms um, and then send traffic to those to see what would stick. And it just, you know, we already really had our foot in the door with Shopify. Um, so I'm like, all right, we'll just abandon the other stuff and refocus this productized consulting offering solely on Shopify. And very, like within six months, people, maybe less than six months, I started getting referrals from acquaintances saying, well, you know, someone mentioned Shopify to me and I know you're the Shopify guy. So I sent them to you. 
I didn't know I was the Shopify guy. That's just that's the side effect you get when you niche down, when you pick a clear, concise positioning like that. I love that. And so this going from more general to more specific has actually increased your business and, and you've gotten more clients, more sales as a result. Yeah, it's uh, it's paradoxical. So the tighter, you know, the smaller your niche, the smaller your audience becomes, the easier it becomes to sell, the more you look like an authority and expert and the better you get at your job. So, you know, when you're, let's say, you know, how many clients does a solopreneur, does a single freelancer, does someone in that position really need to get, um, you know, to, to reach their goal of say a hundred thousand dollars a year? Well, you know, if you've, you know, if you sell 10, $10,000 projects a year, maybe you only need 10 clients. So even if you, your niche was only a thousand people that could be more than enough to support your business. And that's, what's paradoxical, paradoxical about niching down. You're increasing, you're not, you shouldn't look at it as, oh, I'm reducing the number of customers I could potentially sell to. You should look at it as I am radically increasing the relevancy of my marketing message to my market. I love that. And what's interesting is, is the word of mouth that spreads from that because sure enough, if I know you, I know you do Shopify, you help, you help people Shopify stores, improve their sales and, and whatnot. If I meet somebody who does have Shopify, it does use Shopify, does have questions about that. You're the person who's going to come to mind. I think that's, yeah, it, that's ultimately it, the power in it. Is it not? Oh, Absolutely. You know, it makes it easy and concise to remember. You know, if you, a lot of times I'll ask someone, I said, oh, so what do you do? And if they're a freelancer, they'll go through this, you know, if you say to someone, like, hey, what do you do? Oh, I'm a garbage man. Okay, I know what you do. You say to a freelancer, what do you do? And you suddenly, they'll launch into this three-minute explanation. That's just like, you want to tear your hair out behind of it, and you have no idea what they're talking about. The advantage, you know, you know you're, you've got your positioning down. You know, when, in 10 seconds, you could tell someone what they do. So for me, I just say, well, I help Shopify store owners uncover hidden profits in their store. Oh, wow. Okay. So right away, if you're in my target market, you want to ask me more. That's awesome. I love that. And I, and I think the implications are pretty far-reaching. Um, and, and while paradoxical, like you said, I think, I don't think it's, it's, it's true, though. I, I think that's – it also st- stems, I think, from – kind of becoming an authority in the space too, uh, wouldn't you say? Like, I'm curious about your take on that because even though you, you probably were just as much of an expertise on, on you know, e-commerce and online sales as a whole, um, tagging it, like niching down and, and, and tagging yourself with Shopify kind of makes you the Shopify guy, doesn't it? Or, or am I off on that? No, you're right. You're absolutely right. I mean, there's, like, I'm, as you know, I was very familiar with WordPress and I was familiar with big commerce and, a, you know, half a dozen other e-commerce platforms, but we chose to do the one and I worked, you know, a team of three people. We chose the one that gave us joy. So, you know, I see a lot of, a lot of people are scared to turn away business, but if it's business that you don't like, that doesn't bring you joy, why are you doing it? Like you, if you own your own business, you are solely responsible for everything, including your own happiness. So do the stuff that gives you joy. In our case, working with, you know, entrepreneurs and Shopify was the cross section of like, these are great projects. So that's what we went with. And I think it also helps too. I guess I'm curious, like, do you think there would have been a different response if you had say focused on WordPress websites or something like that? Or do you think like, do you think that there's something to the fact that using Shopify it kind of says something about that that particular client as well, that they have some sort of business, that they have a certain amount of like revenue to be able to pay for your services and so on and so forth. Well, there's an interesting thing. When you niche down on a technology platform, you um, more often than not, you're going to be um, dealing with the business owner because typically the business owner is the one who chooses the technology platform. So something like WordPress is now so broad. It's something like a third of the internet runs on WordPress that that's if you chose that as a platform, you have in no way niche down. Whereas, you know, something like Shopify, when we were on it, I think they had, you know, when we made this decision, they they had probably just cracked 100,000 stores. You know, now they're over 200,000. Um, but still, I mean, that's nothing in comparison to, to WordPress. But yeah, when you pick a, you know, your niche doesn't have to be just a technology platform. But if it is, oftentimes, you know, what you've unintentionally done is pick something that is a decision made by the business owner. It's so it, it makes your life much easier because you deal generally you'll be dealing with the business owner. There That's was awesome. I, 
there's some good info in there. I wish I could have said that uh, more concisely. <laughs> no, it's it's perfect. It's awesome. So tell me a little bit about, I, you know, we'll get into uh, online sales, and this all kind of ties to it as well. But I'm curious about how you uh, you personally kind of set up shop. Um, yeah, Shopify, I get it. Uh, set up shop to kind of, um, you know, to structure your business and, and how you approach clients or how they approach you. So tell me a little bit about how that works. Like if I were to approach you, what, you know, I have a Shopify website. How do you, how can you help me out? Is it a question of how do we, how do we work with clients who approach us or how do we yeah. get leads? Well, it, I, I think it'll, uh, I think I'll go to the, the leads piece in a second, but I just want to get clarity on what you guys actually provide um, and how you provide it um, to kind of get an idea of, of the business as a whole, of, of EtherCycle and everything as a whole. Sure. So the, um, we reframe things, you know, I want to be, you know, when clients hire us, I want us to hire us as, you know, for, for strategy first, and then as a pair of hands second. So if someone comes and they're just like, well, I've got this, like, you know, do this, this design tweak and this development stuff, I could do that for for you, but it's, you know, you need to tell me why you're doing it that way. And we're probably not going to work together well if you're just dictating things to me. I want people, um, you know, to be taking a higher level approach. And we do do that fulfillment and that, you know, those tweaks and that stuff. Um, but, you know, ultimately the separation is, is doing brains versus hands work. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, we're providing strategy on this more holistic scale um, with Shopify stuff. But in short, you know, essentially we have a, you know, a small team of people who can do um, strategy, marketing, um, graphic design, and development. And when you combine all of those things, that's everything you need um, to have this this sort of holistic e-commerce practice um, in an agency setting where you can provide someone everything they need to build the complete life cycle that their customer goes through. You know, someone goes from Facebook, like a prospect on Facebook to a brand evangelist. Well, there's all kinds of steps they took in between there. And there were all kinds of, of things that had to happen in that client's business to enable that. And that's what we're, we're offering. That's awesome. Okay. And so how do you go about, obviously word of mouth is going to be important, play an important role. Um, but how do you guys go about actually acquiring uh, customers? So that, that lead generation cycle, so to speak. So now, now and now and forever, and since we started, the best clients are going to be from word of mouth. Yep. Um, and I, we try and foster that. So I've got, you know, if you really want to foster word of mouth, you have to do two things: give people great experiences and do everything you can to keep yourself top of mind. And I think the best way to do both of those, um, you know, and, and generate that goodwill, and that's what it's about, um, is through content marketing. So we've got a podcast for Shopify store owners. We've got a newsletter for email course, um, info products now. And what's great about all that stuff is like, yeah, it's free content that'll help people grow their store. So I, you know, I produce it, um, and, and people consume it and they immediately have a sense of, you know, like, Oh, okay. These people are, you know, this guy, that team, they are Shopify experts. The other side effect of it is, you know, a lot of it is very opinionated. I'm like, from experience, this is what I think, you know, these are the way to tackle these problems. So, for lack of a better term, you could view it as brainwashing. Like I would much rather have the clients, you know, as clients, I would much rather have the people who've listened to my podcast, who've read my newsletter, because they're already familiar with like, you know, how I work and the the business processes I value versus someone who just comes in, you know, who cold calls and is like, all right, now, you know, pitch me on your services. I don't want to pitch you, you know, go, <laughs> go out, read my newsletter, my podcast. You'll probably be, you'll be better off and I'll be better off. That's awesome. I love it. And so, you know, when it comes to what, what are some key takeaways, um, I guess for, for online sales, like I, I know it's, it's fundamentally like it's going to be concierge, like it depends what you're selling and so on and so forth. But there are, are there any key takeaways that I guess anyone selling anything online can say, yep, I just grabbed that nugget from this, like any fundamentals, any like evergreen uh, bits of advice that you can give people when it comes to online sales? Absolutely. So everything that people do comes down to relationships. The thing that that baffles me and frustrates me is that we have, you know, when you are a small business, a solopreneur or a small team, you are lucky and truly you are lucky and fortunate if you're in that position because it means you can have personal relationships with your customers. You can be the face of your company. You can put yourself out there. 
instead of doing, you know, the very generic branded stuff that um, big brands do. Big brands do that stuff because they can't afford to have that one-on-one relationship. So it's very frustrating for me when I see, you know, like a one, two, three-man operation send out these very polished HTML newsletters that are just utter garbage. I mean, they're impersonal shit. Yeah. Yeah. And when you do that, like, why bother doing that? It would be so much better if you, as a single business owner, tried to develop a relationship by sending plain text emails. Like, would you send your mom an HTML newsletter? Never, ever would you do that. So right. why are you doing it to your customers if you don't have to? If you view everything as a relationship, you'll be much better off. Um, and I think, you know, everyone w- starts an online business with the idea that their website is the complete one and done sales process. And it isn't the case. You know, we know statistically someone may visit a website uh, up to five times before making a purchase. And the reason is they're, they're developing a relationship with you. They're building trust until they're comfortable enough to buy from you. Yeah, that's awesome. I love it. Very powerful stuff. Why? Yeah, why that's why do you- the, the core tenant of, of, um, you know, of our strategy and our, our marketing. Okay. And so do you, do you, I guess, I guess to clarify, are you primarily working with these type of small, smaller, um, type, um, businesses like, uh, you know, maybe a few employees to maybe a, a dozen or something like that? Yeah. Our requirement is not, you know, we don't view them by revenue. We qualify them by, um, the size of their team. And as soon as someone, you know, there's a threshold where as soon as they get over a certain size, they stop being fun to work with. You know, there's too many processes in place, too many, it becomes too bureaucratic. There's too much red tape and you can run a hugely successful business. You know, we have several, probably five or six Shopify clients doing seven figures now and they have very small teams. A couple of them are, are still solopreneurs um, doing those seven figures with just, you know, by outsourcing stuff. And those are the people that are really exciting and really fun to work with because they are personally and emotionally invested in the success of their business and their product. And that passion, that enthusiasm is what makes them fun to work with. That's awesome. I love it. So this is a selfish question um, because uh, I'm doing more and more kind of um, creative agency type uh, type work myself. And, and so I'm always really curious to learn from other people who I think have, you know, done it, done it right. And so I look at the way you're building your business and, and what you guys have done. And I think you, you've done it right. I'm curious how you how you go through the process of vetting. Uh, potential clients. Uh, and I've asked this for, for, to a, a few people because I, I feel like I always pick up some nuggets and stuff like that. And, and Brandon Dunn, um, I had him on, I know he, you guys are friends, um, had him on the show a, a little while ago and, and loved his advice on how to, how he personally goes about vetting clients. But I'm just curious, how do you, I guess, how do you improve that, that system right there? Because I feel like there's a lot of, and this applies, I think, to freelancers, to consultants, um, to any service-based business um, where, it, especially if it's going on larger contracts where there's some sort of like, sales involved, like calls or presentations or something like that. How do you make sure you're not just wasting your time on people who aren't going to buy? That's an excellent question. Um, the trick I think, um, is to follow if you can, uh, product ladder theory. So, so say someone reaches, you know, the first step is someone, uh, fills out a contact form, say on, on website rescues.com, the, you know, our productized service or eatcycle.com, the agency, um, service. And I'm going to consolidate those websites. That's an aside. Um, but let's say someone you know fills out the contact form. They'll then get an immediate autoresponder from me, and it's it's meant to look personal. And no one, I even wrote "sent from my iPhone" across the bottom, and no one catches that this thing sent way too quickly. Um, that's fine, and it just asks three qualifying questions. That's it. And the first one is, "Tell me about yourself." I'm picky about who I work with. And then the second is, "How much traffic did you get in the last 30 days?" And the third is, "What is your conversion rate in the last 30 days?" You know, because if they say, "Well, I've got," you know, a million visitors and my conversion rate's 10%. I know that either they're lying or they're doing so well, there's really nothing I could do to help them. Um, so I just ask, like, that's step one. You got to fill out the contact form and then get an email that asks you three pretty straightforward questions and two are just numbers. So if you can reply to that email and when you reply to it, you're nice, you seem like a nice person and you can, you can fill out, you can write in a, a complete sentence and use proper grammar um, and I don't object to your business in some ethical way, then from that point, like if it's something I'm really excited about, I'll say, okay, let's schedule a call. Here's my Calendly link. And each of these are like tiny micro engagements. You know, the first is fill out my contact form. Okay, it's this tiny thing. Just respond to an email with three simple questions. 
And the, the first one is that very, like, you know, where I'm reframing the relationship that I'm the prize by saying, tell me about yourself. I'm picky about who I work with. Because I do, I want to know what, you know, what they're about. And there's some people who, like, won't even, can't even be bothered and are offended by, by that. And it's like, okay, clearly we would have not worked because your ego is too big. So I've already vetted them and gotten them out. Um, so then once, you know, they reply to the email and I like it, I, you know, maybe I'll ask a follow-up question. Maybe I'll do, most people I will flat out decline. Um, and maybe, uh, and I'll say, okay, if I'm really excited about it, I'm like, that, eh, that's really cool. I'll tr- get them to book a call and we'll just talk on the phone about it and we'll see, you know, from there you can easily develop what, um, your relationship should look like. But if you're very popular and you're not too discriminating, you can waste a ton of time on the phone. So you got to be cautious there. Um, if I'm on the fence about it, this is the crazy thing I'll do. I will send them to Clarity. Clarity.fm is a service to allow people to pay for phone calls. You know, yep. you can book a call with Mark Cuban on Clarity.fm for ten thousand dollars an hour, <laughs> or something crazy. Um, or you could talk to me for two bucks a minute, and that's what I do with people where I'm on the fence about it. I'm like, listen, this sounds great. Let's start with a a road mapping call, a road mapping workshop. Um, there's many benefits to starting with this. It really it reduces the risk for you because we get to get a sense of what we're like um, working together before we jump into a project. So just book your clarity call here. Well, a 15 minute call costs 30 bucks. If the person does not want to bother spending $30 to talk to me to ensure the success of their project, they won't do it. And they like automatically I knew they were tire kickers and they weren't going to spend anything. You know, if I want to know if someone will spend $5,000 or $10,000, I got to get them to spend 15 bucks first. Yep. I love that. And so how do you decide if, if you're on the fence, I guess, in that, in that context, like to send them that way? It's, um, I wish I could give you something better, but it is literally a gut check. Yeah, it's like, does, great. does this, you know, and that's, you know, I think clients have to realize when they're talking to a vendor, um, they are pitching them, you know, they, uh, they're pitching them on working with them. So they should be, you know, they should try and make it sound exciting. So, you know, some people will, will send me really, well-crafted good emails and those people don't don't have to pay they don't get sent to clarity but mo- most people i will send to clarity and and from clarity how many people once you send that link actually just like drop off and don't even pay with the whatever few bucks it might take to get on a call with you you know i should really track the numbers um but i'm a a lot of people do go through clarity and what's interesting like once once we get on the clarity call People are so much more engaged. They're friendlier. They're taking notes. They're interested because they're invested. You know, if it's just like a free call with a, if it's just me saying, hey, you know, call this 800 number and we'll talk about your project, then they're kind of a, like, they're a KG pain because it's like walking into a car dealership and they feel like they're talking to a car salesman. I don't want that. I, I want them to view it as an investment in their business when they talk to me. So, okay. So <clears throat> I, I love this idea because I, 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 I've, I've never actually tried using clarity in that, that capacity. Um, sometimes I'll just use clarity if, if I get like emails in my inbox asking for essentially personal attention and then I'll just send people to clarity, but I'm really, can I use it for that too? Yeah. But I, but I love how you use it for this. I'm just curious, like, um, could you like, I, I, I'm sure there's certain clients where you're just like, yeah, you know, they're serious, you know, they're not going to pull your chain, but if there's people you're just where it's, uh, you know, it's, you're just not sure you haven't met them before or something like that. Um, they seem well-intentioned. Is there any downside to, to going the clarity route to begin with just as, just as part of your vetting process? I don't think so. I mean, there's people who are going to, who are going to disappear from clarity, but I think those people would have never bought a project to begin with. I think they weren't serious. And that's the realization you have to make that kind of, you know, a lot of a lot of people push back. They're like, "Oh, if I if I make the pay for Clarity, they'll never have a call with me, and I'll lose that business." No, if they won't book the Clarity, you probably never had that business to begin with. That's a really good point. That's gold. I'm gonna try that out, Kurt. I'm gonna take some notes and track it, and I'll send you some feedback on that when I when I test that out. I love. That. I'm thinking it's like fifty fifty. Yeah, but I but I think that's um I just think how how smart like how you know using a simple tool like that it fundamentally just saying hey you know I'm I'm putting my that your time is valuable and, and you're saying, hey, put you know, if you're intending, especially again, you know, for ten, twenty thousand dollar plus contracts, uh, you can put in that skin in the game. Uh, yeah. You know, for that. And the amazing part is, you know, the people who go through the clarity call, probably, you know, you you'll you'll have, you know, easily a ninety percent close rate after the clarity call. That's a really good point. Wow. It's good stuff. That's gold. Like that's the number to focus 
focus on is after Clarity Call, how many of those people become clients? And I would say probably nearly all of them. That's awesome. Ooh, that's good. I'm going to start, I have to start tracking this stuff and, and test it out. Love it. Okay, cool. Well, um, you know, we're coming up to the top of our time together. So let's shift this over to, uh, to some of the stuff you have going on right now. It looks like you have a few courses and, and some other stuff. So tell us a little bit about kind of what your, where, I guess, where people can learn from you, what you're working on and, uh, and, and all that stuff. Sure. Well, uh, so we'll go with the, the free stuff first. I would encourage people, you know, uh, give the, uh, the unofficial Shopify podcast a listen. I host that. That's unofficialshopifypodcast.com. Um, lots of good stuff in there. We got good interviews coming up. Um, and depending on when this posts, either they came up or in the past, but with, you know, folks like Rand Fishkin from Moz and, and Neil Patel from um, uh, Crazy Egg and, mm-hmm. and Kiss Metrics. Um, and uh, so that's a good sore, good resource. Uh, my newsletter, I sent a lot of stuff out. Um, and of course, uh, we just released a book and video course that's doing very well. Um, and that's, you know, you know, I talked about that, that sales process of you have to view it. It doesn't start and stop at your website. It's part of a much bigger chain. Well, actually, you know, those thoughts are very clear to me because we wrote a whole book on it. Um, we put it into a manual and included screencasts, and that's available at ecommerce-bootcamp.com. And then for your listeners, um, what I've already set up is a coupon code to get the complete bundle, uh, which includes the book, a bunch of bonuses, and the videos for, for 25% off um, if they use the coupon code TRENCHES. I love it. This is great. Yeah, I'm that's sure my plug. That checking it out right now and I would highly recommend it. Um, I'll make sure that's linked up in the show notes. Uh, this looks fantastic. So yeah, for those who are listening, if you are selling anything online, you should probably take a look at this. Uh, it looks like it'll be hugely beneficial and, and the bonuses look great too. So yeah, Kurt, really appreciate having you on the call, man. Um, very insightful and I appreciate you uh, taking the time today to uh, speak with us and share your advice and insights. No, my pleasure. I The pleasure is all mine. I really enjoyed it. It's always fun to talk. I love podcasts. Awesome. Yeah, I agree completely. Cool. And then, uh, so I guess uh, if, if people want to reach out to you, they, I guess the, the main point of contact is KurtElster.com? Yeah, I would recommend um, probably like for a quick question, shoot me on Twitter. I love Twitter because it limits people's questions. Yeah. Um, you could try to email me. I don't guarantee I'll respond just because I get a lot of emails. Or um, you know, sign up for my newsletter and then reply to that. That really, I'm much more inclined to re- uh, answer questions you know, in replies to the newsletter. Yep. Same here. I love that. Okay. Great. Kurt. Kurt, I really appreciate it. We'll make sure everything's linked up in the show notes and, uh, um, thank you so much for being on the call. My pleasure. And that wraps up another broadcast of in the trenches. If you'd like to check out the show notes, just head over to tommorcuscom slash podcast, where you'll find the latest broadcast. And if you enjoyed today's broadcast, please do me a favor and leave a rating and review on iTunes. That's the fastest, simplest, easiest way to support my creative work, and it would really mean a lot to me. As always, this is Tom Morcus, and if you're listening to this, you are the resistance.